I'm Henry R. Mockingbird, your host with the mustache here. And a few years back, I did a list called the top five movies everyone likes but I could care less about. And after, I did a top eight list called the top eight movies I like but everyone else hates. Well, I'm going to update that list. Instead of making it an eight, let's make it a ten. This is my top 10 movies I like that everyone else hates. Let's get a few honorable mentions out of the way. Temple of Doom, Narnia 2, Prince Caspian, The Hobbit, The Unexpected Journey, and Avatar. Let's get on with the actual list. Number 10, The Black Cauldron. I was extremely disappointed by Wish, and I'm always saying that modern Disney doesn't tend to take a lot of risks, so I went back and watched their biggest risk, The Black Cauldron, the film that is often referred to to be Disney's darkest hour, and revisiting it, I'm like, this is what's considered Disney's darkest hour? Not something like Chicken Little or The Wild or half of the direct-to-video sequels? Not great, but it's not bad either. It's actually pretty good. Tarkin is pretty forgettable as a character. He's just a pig keeper, not much else. It's the other characters around him that are more interesting to me. Princess Ilanwi has a lot of spunk and can look after herself really well. Peter Flum, in addition to being a really funny name, is also a really funny character. He has a pretty good running gag. Every time he lies, his heartstring breaks. The witches are also wickedly fun, one of them being played by Billy Hayes, a.k.a. Witch Hazel from H.R. Puff and stuff. And here's a hot take for you. I actually don't mind Gertie. Sure, he's annoying, but he's not even in the movie for that long. In fact, he disappears for a lot of it. I think the Creeper is more annoying than him. He's always cuddling up to the Horn King's behind. And speaking of which, man is the Horn King really horrifying. There's a reason why this guy was on my top 10 scariest kid movie moments. This movie is so freaking dark, and I love it for that. I've heard a lot of people complain that this is too dark for a Disney movie, but to me, that's like complaining about... That's like saying Chernabog is too dark, or saying half the stuff in Hunchback is too dark. I think... Kids can handle dark material, guys. And it's not just dark material. There's blood, there's risque jokes, and there's drinking. You know, for kids. The movie may be dark, it may be mature, but I love it for that. I hope one day Disney can make something like this again because it's not looking too good for them right about now. Number 9 Disney's Pixar's Cars Ah, Cars. Now, this was a movie that was on my original top eight list, 
So I'll try not to repeat what I said in that video. But with that said, I don't get how so many online reviewers dislike or even hate the first Cars movie. The second one, I get. That's an abomination. But the first one? Really? I hear stuff like, Oh, it was Pixar selling out. They just wanted to make toys. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but almost every franchise is meant to sell toys. My two cents on it. If a movie or show is meant to sell toys, it ultimately doesn't matter as long as that movie or show is good. And I can say with full confidence that Cars is a good movie. I also hear people say, Oh, couldn't this story have been told with regular humans? Yeah, but I could also see what Pixar were going for when they were like, hmm, let's take it a step further and make it about a world of cars. And yeah, the idea of sentient cars is nothing new, but the idea of making a whole world about nothing but sentient cars, that's kind of original. So here people say, oh, this world doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's examine that. Cars drink oil just like humans drink water. Impounds are like jails to cars. Parking boots are like handcuffs to cars. Tractors stay in the fields and are basically cows. Trucks are like trailer homes to cars. Phones are like speakers. Truck stops are like hotels. And yes, there is stuff you can nitpick at. Like, how does Doc stack all those books? Or how does a car have a mattress? But at least it's not as stupid as the sequel where you have Mater eating wasabi or a human bathroom or the freaking Pope mobile for crying out loud. Enough talking about what people don't like about this movie. What do I like about this movie? Well, I love the residents of Radiator Springs. I love the more quiet scenes with them and thus them being themselves. And I love the old country feel. It kind of reminds me of when I went on road trips with my family. I also really like the animation. It holds up really well. You can see every detail. Like when a car gets wrecked, you really feel like it's getting wrecked. When the cars shine, you really see the shine. And you see all the rust stains on Mater. And speaking of which, let's talk about him. Mater is actually pretty funny in this movie. He's not insufferably annoying like he is in the sequel. That's mostly because here he plays the comic relief. They know just when to use him and when to not use him. And sometimes he does get a line that cracks me up, like this one. Who knew this girl, Doreen? Good looking girl. Looked just like a Jaguar. Only she was a truck. You know, I used to crash into her just so I could spoke to her. What are you talking about? I don't know. Sometimes he even has a reaction that gets a laugh out of me. And I also like Lightning McQueen and his character arc of going from an asshole to a humble. He also learns that you don't need to live your life on the fast lane. You can take it easy. And he's played by Owen Wilson, who was born to play this role. 
Chick Hicks is a pretty fun baddie to watch. The best way I can describe him is that he's like my generation's Biff and that you love to hate him. By far, the best character in the whole movie is Doc Hudson. My favorite scene with him is when he's race car driving. And it really hits me in the fields because we are seeing the real Doc Hudson Hornet. Mm. Doc Hudson is the heart and soul of this movie. And it's a wonderful swan song for Paul Newman. This is one of those cases where the actor is the character, especially given how Paul Newman was a race car driver himself. David has a pretty good character arc of letting go of your troubled past and learning to move on. Hearing his backstory is really sad and also really hits me in the field hearing that he was rejected. This movie is not perfect. In fact, no movie is perfect. This movie has its problems, some small, some big. Let's start with the small. For example, what is Mac talking into when he's talking to Lightning McQueen on the speaker? His rear view mirror or... What are the odds that Lightning McQueen would end up in the same place as the fabulous Hudson Hornet? Like, seriously, what are the odds? Let's move on to the big ones, starting with Chick Hicks. Like, how is Chick Hicks able to cheat so much and he never gets caught? Now, I know a lot of you might say, oh, it's because he bumps the car so fast no one sees them. Well, that argument doesn't hold much gasoline when you stop to consider that these races have cameras that targeted your every move. He should have been disqualified for causing that car wreckage, and he should have definitely have been disqualified for causing the King's crash. And why didn't Sally go to the race? She was the most destroyed by Lightning McQueen leaving. I mean, for crying out loud, Sheriff of all cars went. Why didn't she? Rather you love or hate cars, can we all agree that it has a killer soundtrack? Number 8. Matrix Reloaded and Matrix Revelations. I have a bit of a hot take coming your way. With The Lord of the Rings is to fantasy, the Matrix trilogy is to sci-fi. We're talking about the Matrix trilogy, starting with the best of the trilogy, Matrix Reloaded. Let's get the cons out of the way. There's a fight between Neo and a bunch of clones of Agent Smith, and the CGI is on par with a video game. While there are parts of the film where the CGI shows its age, there are other parts where it's aged gracefully, particularly the freeway chase scene freeway chase scene is freaking awesome having trinity zipping around on a motorcycle and seriously whoever gave morbius a katana needs a freaking raise in fact all the action scenes are awesome i'm pretty sure any diehard matrix sequel hater could not deny that the scene that everybody seems to point out as to why The Matrix Reloaded is bad is this scene. 
Come on, guys. It's just one scene. And the other reason that people point out to this movie being bad is the architect. Two reasons as to why people hate this scene. Number one, they hate this scene because they do understand what he's saying and hate the twist. And the other reason as to why people hate this scene is that they have no idea what he's saying to the point where Will Ferrell made fun of it. And yeah, I cannot defend that. Every time I watch this movie and it gets to this scene, I have to turn on the subtitles to get a word in edgewise. As for the twist itself, that there was more than one chosen one, I kind of like it. It subverts the chosen one trope. Going to the stuff I like, I love seeing the old characters and how they interact with some of the new characters. And even the old characters get a bit more development like Neo fearing that he's going to lose Trinity. I also like how Morbius is slowly starting to question his beliefs. I also like how we get to see the city of Zion, and I really love how it looks. It's very clockwork-based, almost reminding me of the underground city of Metropolis. We get to meet two of the new characters. The first one I'm going to talk about is the kid. I like this guy. I like how loyal he is, especially to the people of Zion and Neo. And then there's the other character... The driver of the Nebuchadnezzar, Link himself. He's a pretty cool and fun character and a nice addition to the team. Going back to Zion, I really like how we get to see this city that feels very lived in. And you get to see how this city works with its religion and its politics, and even the Senate room looks pretty cool. I also like that we get to see everyday life in Zion, like seeing Link and his family. I feel like seeing the family kind of adds stakes to the final battle of Zion, which I'll get to when I talk about Revelations. I also like the relationship between Link and Z. It's very believable. She doesn't want to lose Link because she lost someone on the Nebuchadnezzar. But Link pretty much tells her, you're not going to lose me. Now let's talk about the best new character in the movie, Nairobi, played by Jaden Pinkett Smith. Nairobi in battle, she is fierce. She is not overshadowed by anyone. So Commander Locke, who often clashes with Morbius. Even though he's a hothead, you can kind of see where he's coming from. He's trying to be realistic. He can't always believe in faith, but sometimes you gotta have a little faith. There's also Seraph, who has a no-nonsense demeanor and can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Neo as far as fighting skills go. That's pretty impressive. Then there's the new baddie of the series, the Merovingian, played by the guy from Catwoman. I love just how flamboyant this character is. And then there's his wife, Persephone, who I love her and let's say her assets. Like, they really pull the sexy on her big time, baby. 
But now let's talk about the man of the hour. My man, Asian Smith. Woo! Played by the one and only Hugo Weaving. And because of what happened to him in the last movie, a part of him was imported and overwritten and copied and can now, here's the clincher, clone himself and make multiple clones who look exactly like him. And he's the only one who can make Neo feel death. Which I honestly feel makes him even more scary than he ever was in the last movie. Oh. I would feel rather missed if I didn't bring up that the actress who played the Oracle, Gloria Foster, passed away. And she's replaced by Mary Alice in Revelations. May she rest in peace. Wait, there's more. Now we're at Matrix Revelations. My favorite scene is when they're flying away from the machines and they fly up and it's just a beautiful sky. I want that image framed on my wall. It's so visually stunning. And I think Trinity's look on her face says it all without any dialogue. The fight scene between Neo and Bane is so freaking cool. It's also great to see the people of Zion use the mech suits to take down the machines, a.k.a. the Sentinels. A lot of people have criticized this movie for not having enough Matrix in it, but I kind of think that that's this movie's strength rather than its weakness. My only problem with this final battle is that we don't get enough of the main characters. I also like the idea that we get to focus on supporting characters in the final battle. Not only does it give them something to do, but it makes them all the more vulnerable to be killed by a sentinel. They have no plot armor, they cannot rely on the Matrix, and all they can rely on is guns. I also like the hallway gun fight, which is a nice callback to the first movie. And speaking of fights, I love the final fight between Neo and Asian Smith. The rain aesthetic is cool, and also the fight is straight out of an anime, like Dragon Ball. And somehow it's better than all the fights in Dragon Ball Evolution. Bottom line, I think the Matrix trilogy was an ambitious undertaking for the Wachowskis. And rather than writing off these first two sequels, I think everyone should be celebrating them. Cookies need love like everything does. <laughs> Number seven. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, and Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. I take time. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest is the Avengers Infinity War of Pirates of the Caribbean. And Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End is the Avengers Endgame of Pirates of the Caribbean. Start off this underrated trilogy with this film's new baddie, Cutler Freakin' Beckett, baby. He is a murderous psychopath who is stone cold and will bend the law to get what he wants. This dude is so emotionless. He doesn't show any emotion when he has a gun pointed at his forehead. He's not like Norrington, whose life pretty much got screwed over. And he's not like Davy Jones, 
where he has a tragic backstory. He's pretty much a psycho for no good reason. Just like Matrix Reloaded, this is a case where the second installment in the trilogy has some of the best action, like Jack Sparrow turning into Buster Keaton, or Will and Jack's crew rolling down a hill in a boned-built cage like it's a marble on a marble run set. Or Will and Norrington sword fighting on a wheel which spins around by itself. I also like Pentel and Rigetti. Sure, they're the dirtier version of those two guards, but I love them. They are downright hilarious. They're like the Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello of this series. Both of them have a lot of great jokes. From slapstick to visual gags, like this one. So like that we get to meet Bootstrap Bill in this movie, who was mentioned quite a bit in the first movie. And I really like the relationship he has with his son, Will Turner. You really feel the father and son-like relationship between them. Talk about the new baddie, the main attraction, Davy Jones. And just look at the detail on him. The CGI on him is amazing, which is insane to think about. Seriously, how does a movie from 2006 somehow look better than all the CGI we have today? This is what happens when you actually give your artists time to breathe. He both manages to be entertaining, cool to look at, but is also intimidating. I also love the build-up to this guy. You don't see his face at first. Then you see his claw, and then you see him and all his glory. In fact, everything surrounding this character is great from his theme song being played on an organ to his sad and tragic backstory, which I'll touch upon at World's End, to his own crew, which are basically fishmen. And they look like something straight out of One Piece. They all have a memorable look and design. Some of my favorites include this hermit crab head looking dude, which Jack knocks his block off quite literally, to this dude who has a eel for a head, which he can stretch out and grab things with. Also, really like Davy Jones' pet, the Kraken, which is this tentacle creature that can destroy ships with ease. I also like the character Tia. She's always cracking jokes and celebrating what a twisted world we live in. And speaking of great female characters, we have Elizabeth. I like that we get to see a more badass side to her in this movie, which was only hinted at in the first movie. In this movie, she's sword fighting and kicking ass, and we only get to see more of this version of Elizabeth at World's End. And speaking of which, it will fittingly end at World's End. This movie is as close to a masterpiece 
as you will ever get, which is strange that I have that opinion because most people seem to think that this is the most bloated one. The plot is real simple. It's just the pirates banding together to stop Lord Beckett and the East Indian Trading Company. That's it. And the movie isn't that much longer than the last one. Not to say that this movie doesn't have any problems. It does. The first problem is, why did they kill off the Kraken? Yeah, this thing that they were building up so much in the last movie gets killed off screen without any fanfare. Another problem I have with this movie is that Will and Elizabeth have this rift between them that goes nowhere. Talk about the things I do like. I love how freaking dark this movie is. Seriously, the first scene is a literal hanging. We see people being hung and their feet dragging. We see corpses on a wagon. We even see a kid getting hung. And not only that, but this whole movie pushes the PG-13 rating to the limit. Continue the darkness with one of the saddest scenes in Disney history as Elizabeth sees her dead father and she's begging him to come back. Okay, I think that's enough of the dark stuff. Let's talk about the fun stuff. This movie has a lot of memorable and beautiful shots. To see all the four main characters on screen for the first time. And here's a good thing. They actually have chemistry. Crazy concept, I know. Jack Sparrow has a great character arc of wanting immortality. He's been screwing everybody around left and right. What he really needs is a slap in the face with reality. He needs to learn that the meaning of life isn't material wealth. It's about being a good person, living with yourself forever. The great thing about this movie is Barbosa. He went from being a cameo in the last movie to absolutely stealing the show. Him and Jack Sparrow often try to one-up each other. Seriously, they argue like a married couple. And Elizabeth goes full pirate in this movie and gives a great speech. Go full in on Davy Jones' backstory. And really flesh it out. We learn that he had a romance with Tia, who turns out to be the goddess Calypso. This weird romance works. We see how Davy Jones is in literal pain in this movie. Talk about the final battle. It is fun and exciting all throughout, with Elizabeth and Will getting married to Hans Zimmer's beautiful music, to Barbosa's sword fighting, to Jack Sparrow and Davy Jones sword fighting on top of the sales mask. I don't care what anyone says. This trilogy is worth the weight in gold. Number six. Transformers 2007. Hot take time time. Marvel owes its very success to Transformers 2007. Since they pretty much piggyback off of Michael Bay's success by combining action, spectacle, and comedy, baby. So all you Marvel fans have this movie to thank for the Avengers. That's not to say that this movie is perfect. 
It isn't. Like, the comedy is very, let's say, hit and miss. Like Bumblebee peeing on Agent Simmons and the whole spanking the monkey joke. That just made my eyes roll. Then Frenzy transforms and he starts walking down the aisle and walking off the plane and somehow no one notices this thing. That was a part that was really irritating. What do I like? Well, I love the stupid humor. There are so many lines in this movie that I just quote verbatim. Like Glenn, played by Anthony Anderson. Every line that comes out of his mouth is just meme worthy. For me, the chemistry between Ebbs and Lennox is what makes this movie. Lennox has a real longing to get home to his wife and hold his baby girl. One of the best action scenes with them is when Scorponaut surprisingly attacks them in the desert. The other one is where they get their revenge on Blackout. And seeing them getting to take out Blackout after all the heartache Blackout caused them is so satisfying. Let's talk about the main character, Sam, played by Shia LaBeouf. And I know Sam tends to get a lot of hate for saying, no, 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 or screaming a lot. But put yourself in his shoes. Wouldn't you be doing the same thing? And to those who say, oh, he doesn't have a character arc. Oh, he does nothing. We must be watching two different movies. Because Sam does have an arc in this movie starts out with an L on his forehead, but as the movie progresses, he grows a spine and gets his act together to the point where he actually sacrifices himself to save the cube and takes out Megatron. The relationship between Sam and Bumblebee is the heart of the movie. And that scene where Sam is unable to save Bumblebee and Bumblebee is helpless is arguably more heart-pounding than any action scene in this movie. I love Michaela, played by Megan Fox, and she is more than meets the eye. Mechanically inclined, she can put stuff back together and hotwire a car, she earns a lot of mad respect. Her daddy was a criminal who taught her a lot about cars, which ended her up in juvie. Sam and Michaela make a great team, and they stick with each other through it all. A great scene with her is when she's contemplating over the fact that Sam might die, but then she says, I'm not going to sit here. Let's get going, Bumblebee. And her and Bumblebee pretty much bring new meaning to the term roadkill as they take down Brawl. And there's Agent Simmons, played by John DeTuro. He is a fast-talking, hilarious wisecracker who has some of the funniest lines in the movie. He starts out the film as a jerk, but then becomes the human ally for the Autobots. And speaking of which, let's talk about them. Bumblebee communicates via radio. Ratchet is a bit of a goofball. Ironhide is badass and trigger happy. And then there's Jazz, who's smooth and funky. And the great and noble leader Optimus Prime himself, voiced by Peter Cullen. 
And the CGI looks amazing for 2007. Even the use of practical effects in this movie is beyond impressive. I've talked about the Autobots. Let us talk about the Decepticons. And they are horrifying. Not just in their design, but the fact that they're completely indestructible. I mean, Optimus cannot take down Megatron without help. Ratchet and Ironhide have trouble taking down Starscream. And Frenzy, who's like a foot tall, gives the humans a rough time. The final battle is Chef's Kiss. Everything from Ironhide shooting in midair to Optimus Prime and Megatron fighting. This whole movie is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich of awesomeness. And I will hear nothing else. And to all you haters out there, I would advise you to... Roll out!